<laughs> Good evening. Um, welcome to the show tonight. <laughs> I've been having a sneezing and coughing all day long. And, um, you know, I looked it up and it's symptoms consistent with uh, what they call <laughs> a rubber respiratory tract infection in your eye. And, and um, uh, so thankfully, the topic tonight is on that very same subject. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm going to learn a lot about this topic, and I hope that you get your pen and pencil ready, because you and I are going to learn about what they call URI. So stay tuned. <laughs> we have a great show for you tonight. And uh, as usual, it's Monday and it's fresh, natural, and live. Hello, you know, it's amazing. I feel so much more relief now. You know, I don't know. It must be the fact that our experts are in the room and and I'm about to hear uh, about this knowledge about URI. It just seems like, you know, that little transition phase is all I need, getting closer to the knowledge. And what we hope to share with you tonight, as we do every Monday night, is share some knowledge to empower you on ways to optimize your health. You know, this is the time of year that... Um, you know, upper respiratory tract infections are very common. Of course, everybody's talking about the C disease, but it's really not the only cause of upper respiratory tract infections. Uh, there are many causes of upper respiratory tract infections. In fact, you know, oftentimes the symptoms of upper respiratory tract infection could be due to an infection or it could be due to things like allergies or, or something else. And so uh, I have my expert panel here tonight that's going to help us uh, decipher uh, this whole clinical syndrome of upper respiratory tract infection. And of course, we're gonna to try to empower you with information and knowledge on how you can A, prevent uh, such a thing, but um, uh, if not prevent it, which is, I think it's most important, at the very least, we're gonna to try to help you um, uh, suppress symptoms uh, and get relief as soon as possible uh, if you are unfortunate enough to contract an upper respiratory tract infection. So. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring uh, my friends and colleagues on. Uh, we have Dr. Floyd Atkins, uh, who will be with us tonight. Dr. Atkins, how are you doing? I am doing wonderful this evening. How about you? Just fine. Just fine. Thank you very much. And we have Dr. Pamela Atkins, your partner in crime. Hello, Dr. Pam Atkins. How are you today? Hi. Good evening. I'm doing well. Good to see you all. Good to be here. And last but not least, our presenter tonight, Dr. Celeste Palmer. Dr. Palmer, hello. How are you today? Hello. I'm well. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so, you know, this whole issue of upper respiratory tract infection is one that, you know, um, it's 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 a common clinical syndrome. It happens to people year round, but this is the season where, that we see more of it. Uh, and I know you see it a lot in the pediatric population. Um, kind of help us out with some, what, what is upper respiratory tract? Before we get into your presentation, kind of give us some introductory comments on terms of your experience with upper respiratory tract infections and, and uh, you know, how it impacts your practice and your patient population. I mean, and I will talk about this too, but it is the number one um, infection that we see most of the time is, is going to be some type of upper respiratory tract infection. So it keeps us very busy. Um, and of course, this time of the year, it keeps people very anxious. Um, and so that's why I wanted to talk about upper respiratory tract infections, not just for the kids, but also for adults, because it affects all of us. Um, and to just give some history behind it, because sometimes if we demystify uh, illnesses or other things, it helps us, helps it not to be as scary. Because I, I feel like people think that these viruses kind of come out of nowhere and um, attack us. And it doesn't necessarily work like that. So just want to 
give some information behind it and what's happening um, in, inside of our bodies. Wonderful. So anyway, so let's get an understanding upper respiratory tract infection. What's our foundation? Uh, another URI. And so, you know, we start sneezing and so on and so forth. So what should we make of that? Help us out with some of the background information. All right. So when we go ahead and get started. Sure. That'd be okay. fine. So, so I said, oh my, not another URI. So let's, we want to look at upper respiratory tract infections and what that really means. Um, and so I outlined, just so we can stay on topic, examining the upper respiratory tract and discussing pathologies that we often see. Sometimes it's viral, sometimes it's bacteria, but we're going to concentrate more on virus because we're looking at the common cold and treatment modalities and supportive care measures that we use. Okay. Okay. So... Just to kind of as a disclaimer, I know that we're in a global pandemic right now and um, COVID is on everybody's mind. But like you said, I wanted, I wanted us to step to the side and talk about the common cold, which we see more often and has been going on. I mean, we've been seeing continuously through um, the pandemic. So to give, and a lot of times people are coming in because they don't know what the common cold looks like versus what COVID looks like. So just want to, and not saying that this lecture or this talk is going to put a definite on that because some of it is kind of overlapping and cloudy, but just to give us some information to kind of take home and look up on our, on our own and learn about. Okay. So upper respiratory tract illnesses are actually, it's the most common site for infections for adults and for children. About six Children get about six to eight colds per year. And in the daycares, it's even more than that. They probably get about 12 every month. Um, adults get about two to three. And this is considered average. I would now mind you, average is average. Average is not normal, but this is considered average. It is a large economic burden on our society. We spend about $22 billion um, in over-the-counter medications and, and going to doctor's offices on upper respiratory tract illnesses. Uh, we miss about 20 million days of school and work annually and um, about 10 million appointments per year are made because of upper respiratory tract illnesses. So it's a major, it's a major um, topic that we kind of really don't think about, but if we really pull it apart, it, it's something that affects us on a regular basis. So the upper respiratory tract, when we talk about that, we are referring to the nose, the pharynx, sinuses, and the larynx. And I also put in here the eustachian tubes because ear infections are quite um, common in children. And so what happens in infection and illnesses is that this area gets inflamed. Um, there's vasodilation, there's vascular permeability, you get nasal obstruction, you get all this mucus kind of clogging up those areas. That causes us, that stimulates the um, cholinergic system. We get more mucus and we get sneezing to clear this mucus out. So when we get mucus in the nose, we call it rhinitis because rhino is nose. When we get mucus in the pharynx, it's pharyngitis. Sinus is sinusitis. So all of these are just indicators of where the mucus is. Again, I'm trying to simplify it because a lot of times these names and these words, people think that these are illnesses that just kind of came and floated and came down on them. No, it's all connected. It's all mucus. It just tells us where the mucus and inflammation is within the upper respiratory tract. And so on our level, what the patient suffers is cough, congestion, running nose, fever, facial pressure, sneezing, myalgias, these are the things that you feel when your immune system is responding and creating this mucus in your upper airway. And, and to the point you're making, Dr. Palmer, the mucus equals inflammation. And that word itis refers to inflammation. Could it be due to inflammation of an infectious cause or non-infectious cause? And, and as you know, you and I have had a number of conversations regarding this. It's really our own immune system that's 
causing this mucus production because it's one of the earlier barriers of yeah. you know the infection as i'm sure you're going to go through that but i just want to connect that word itis that you pointed out with mucus uh, as yeah. you're outlining yes and so as i said before we have bacteria and we have viruses that get in this upper airway and create this mucus that we're talking about and this inflammation in the airway. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but we are most um, often in, in the bacterial world, we see group A strep that is strep throat or scarlet fever. Um, and that's pretty common. It's about 15% of the pharyngitis that we see. Um, viruses are the other percentage, and those are adenoviruses, rhinoviruses, coronavirus, Coxsackie viruses, and the list goes on. This is a short list, again, in the interest of time, but these are the viruses listed. Bacteria or viral, like I said, we treat them differently. For bacteria, we oftentimes use antibiotics, not in every case, um, but most of the time, antibiotics are used. In viruses, we are not to use antibiotics. So that's colds, flus, sore throat. There are viral sore throat. It's not always strep throat. A lot of times when parents come, they, the child has a sore throat, they are just convinced it is strep. It is not always strep. We actually do test. And if the test comes back positive, we treat. Um, if it's negative, we send the culture. And then we treat or don't treat based on that. Um, and then in some instances, you have bronchitis, which can be viral or bacterial. Ear infections can be either or, and sinus infections can be either or. And this is where your doctor, your PCP, comes in handy because they are to make a clinical diagnosis based on how you're presenting and looking at the whole picture to decide if you need antibiotics or if you don't need antibiotics. Because what is happening is we all know is that we're overusing our antibiotics, which creates a whole different set of um, health issues for us. And just a brief reminder about our viruses in the virus world versus bacteria. Viruses are not living organisms. So what I mean by that is they do not live outside of the host or outside of the body, but so long. They they are dormant, so they'll be alive, but they will not be active outside of the body. So they need the host cell in order to grow and reproduce themselves. So basically they hijack the host cell and use their mechanisms in order to reproduce themselves. Um, and most of the time viruses are systemic. So when you get a viral infection in the upper airway, depending on which virus it is, it can affect, it can cause muscle pain, it can cause headaches, it can cause all of these systemic um, type of symptoms versus bacteria don't usually function like that. Where they infect is usually where you feel their effect. <clears throat> Looking again at viruses. So rhinovirus is the most popular or most common, I should say, not popular, most common and <laughs> And um, we'll spend most of the time. on your perspective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll spend most time talking about that. But 30 to 50 percent of adults and up to 80 percent of children, rhinovirus is year round. Um, it does have peaks, but it is around year round. We know right now we are in flu season, so it, flu virus is five to 15 percent, and then we have coronavirus, five to 15 percent. This is our common coronavirus. Like I said, we're not talking about. SARS-CoV, we're not talking about COVID-19. This is our common coronaviruses. You mean COVID has some uh, family members? Yeah, COVID has a lot of family. <laughs> <laughs> they must be pretty jealous. It's getting all the, uh, all the press. <laughs> and then on the symptom side, all of these viruses in the upper airway, the upper airway responds to everything pretty much the same way. Its defense is runny nose, cough, congestion, sore throat. That is the defense of the body to get rid of these viruses. It's just the degree of symptoms progresses as these viruses become more um, virulent, I would say. So at the top, you have rhinovirus, which is kind of asymptomatic, mild to moderate. And then at the bottom, we have MERS, which is gets into pneumonias, uh, acute, acute respiratory symptoms, multi-system um, multi organ failure. So it progresses depending on the different viruses. And so you mentioned the family. So we're going to look at the family. 
So rhinovirus is actually a part of a family called Pocornoviridae, along with enteroviruses. So if we come over to this side and we look at the Pocornoviridae family, we see that that breaks down into enteroviruses. And inside that, we have the rhinovirus family. Um, then inside the rhinovirus family, they have actually done the phylogenetic tree of rhinovirus to kind of show you how rhinoviruses have um, the lineage of rhinovirus, like a family tree of the rhinoviruses to see how what they actually look like. And this is over, I think, four years, it said it took them to put this together. Um, and I know it, it, it doesn't look, I mean, this is intense. So this is showing us how many different times that rhinovirus has changed and evolved and grown and done different things. And so this is just one of our many viruses. So I did that to show, I'm showing this so that people can kind of see how changing and how quickly evolving viruses are. It's not one virus, one, one um, illness. And this is why for rhinovirus in particular, there is not a treatment for the common cold yet. And I remember in medical school, they said mm -hmm. whoever comes up with that will be, you know, a billionaire. Um, but I don't think anybody's come up with that treatment yet. You mean there's not a vaccine for each one of these? Uh, no. <laughs> Booster, maybe. <laughs> so the common cold, upper URIs, as I've said so many times, are viral. They last about 10 to 14 days. Clinically diagnosed, so you don't need a test necessarily for these common viruses. And it's also a diagnosis of exclusion, making sure you don't have any underlying bacterial infection or some chronic respiratory illness. Risk, highest risk is among children because they're in close contact to each other. Um, smokers and secondhand smokers also, those people with chronic respiratory illnesses like allergies and asthma, immunocompromised, of course, and anybody in persons with um, anatomic abnormalities or anomalies. The environmental risk include being in closed spaces where droplets are being sprayed or, you know, people are laughing or concerts and things like that. Cl uh, closed crowded areas, fall and winter months and also decrease humidity. So it's found that URIs like being indoors with the heat, just like we like being indoors with the heat. You mentioned we don't test for these. Why don't we test for these? I mean, we, I mean, there's a, and, and I, again, I don't want to get too much into the current pandemic, but, but there is a lot of emphasis on testing. And so these URIs are, are like any other URI is, from a clinical standpoint, and anybody can answer this, I'm, but I'm just, Dr. Palmer, we, are there, we have, is there any advantage of testing for these? So the, now we are, they do have tests for some of these, um, mm -hmm. and we don't do it in the clinics. They do it in the hospital. It's called a winter panel. <clears throat> okay. And the winter panel has a lot of these viruses on it, in it. And I think it it is a feel good. It helps the families to feel good because the, at the end of the day, we're not going to treat. So I think that's why, you know, over the years we haven't tested them because the treatment is the same. So, but in this case now, I think we're using it more because we know it's not coronavirus. And I, I think the parents are really nervous. If it's not Corona, then what else could it be? And there's so many other things it could be. And then when they get a name to it, um, it, it is soothing or comforting. And then they can kind of, go home and do the therapies. But but from a medical standpoint, from our standpoint, it doesn't change how we're going to treat them. Okay. Okay. The treatment is the same it's for the any URI, yeah. regardless of the etiology. Right. The current pandemic versus any other, pretty much you're going to treat symptoms, uh, support the individual, et cetera. Right. I mean, with an active infection. Lead. Right. Okay. And I, you know, I think it's, also for institutions, you know, cost versus benefit of, of testing, of course. <clears throat> um, and then with viruses, what we've been hearing a lot of is that, you know, they live on these surfaces for periods of time. And a lot of people are, um, you know, concerned about that. 
Viruses will live, stay on hard surfaces longer than they will on soft surfaces, but the amount of time depends on the environment and the humidity and how much um, viral load is landed on the surface, but they do not endlessly and indefinitely live outside of the body because they need a host. They're, they're like parasites, um, so they cannot survive endlessly outside of the body. For the most part, when we're talking about upper uh, URIs and viral URI, URIs, they are benign, but they can progress to pneumonias, meningitis, sepsis, and bron bronchitis. And this is when this happens, I explained to parents, when that mucus that's kind of sitting in those um, cavities are not moved. So that's part of our job, and we'll talk about this later. And I say our job as a society is to keep that mucus moving and do what we can to thin it out dry it up and get rid of that mucus because when that mucus sits and settles behind in the eustachian tubes that is what we call ear infection when it settles in the sinuses that's the sinusitis and so that's how and when it settles in the lungs that's the pneumonia so that's how these things start off as a cold and end up being something um that is more serious <clears throat> So our body has its defenses and that's, it's, we wanna keep our body working like it should. So in a normal upper respiratory tract, we have hair lining uh, in the nose that we can actually see. We have mucus linings, which catch those particulates. Um, the angle of the pharynx and the nose prevent those particulates from dropping down into the airway. We have ciliated cells, which also help to move those particulates out of the lower mm -hmm. airway and back up into the pharynx. Once it gets back up into the pharynx, we can spit, spit it out, cough it out, um, sneeze it out. And also the adenoids and tonsils have immunologic um, cells that help to attack these pathogens. That's why it's such a misfor- uh, It's unfortunate that a lot of people have gotten, and some of them are still getting their adenoids and tonsils removed. And, but that's a topic for another day. Wait, but I, I know you're going to cover it another day, but- briefly help us with that i mean in most cases it's not a good thing to have those things removed uh, because it's part of our immuno you take you're removing part of your defense system so i mean the thing is children come in with <clears throat> strep throat repeatedly um and, and and that's what we need to talk about your full immune system not just your tonsils and your adenoids because that means your full immune system probably needs some tweaking Mm -hmm. um, but they'll take out the tonsils and adenoids. Now, some people do a lot better. Some children still get strep throat with the tonsils and adenoids removed. So, but now we've mm -hmm. removed that layer of um, protection from your body. Now, our body compensates, obviously. We have lymph tissue everywhere um, and the body does compensate, but it's just some some children that I've seen have the tonsil. A lot of times once they do the tonsils, they just remove the adenoids at the same time. Um, and, and that's the part that is a little bit troublesome for me because if they didn't need both removed, then, then why are we doing that? I mean, somebody with frequent tonsillitis, tonsillitis or adenoiditis, I mean, I guess one should look systemically, right? I mean, why are you getting... Well, I mean, I, I know it works because I've actually talked to one a couple of my patients about, <clears throat> okay, do this for me. One of my patients said, you know, I don't understand what's happening. In the last year, my children keep coming in with strep. And this wasn't happening before. Um, they, they were from another country and they were coming into this country. This didn't happen at home. And now that we're here, this is happening. What's going on? And so I explained to her, you, you know, we've changed, you've probably changed the way that you interact with the environment, the way that you're eating, because there are certain things that you probably don't do here that you were doing before. And, you know, she and I talked about it. And so she changed. She said she would change. She changed it. She changed it. And then I didn't see her for like another year. And then she came back and she said, yeah, you didn't see me for a year because they weren't sick. <laughs> it's like, OK, that was that was the goal. So, um, you know, it works, but you have to be on a, a, a plan and you have to be motivated and really motivate the children because her children were probably eight and 10. So they were of an age where they know what they like and what they don't like. 
but you have to get everybody motivated and on board because it'll help decrease your doctor visits um, and you're coming into the clinic with the same thing over and over again. Fascinating. All right. And then on a cellular level, let's look at what happened. What <laughs> happened. Now, this is actually just one method. There are different ways that the virus uh, viruses get into the cells, but this is just one method. And so this is a cell um, in the, this, did I'm sorry, can you see my pointer? Yep. Okay, this is the um, virus and this is inside of a capsid. So it binds to the plasma membrane, the plasma membrane pulls it inside, we call it endocytosis. Once it gets inside, it takes its coat off, gets comfortable. Makes itself at home. Itself at home. <laughs> and basically it takes over, it hijacks the cell. So now the cell is no longer making and doing the function that it normally does. It hijacks it and makes it help it reproduce itself. So it releases the RNA, it translates, it replicates. The cell is doing nothing for itself. It reassembles the um, viruses release outside of the cell after they get reassembled. Sometimes when they release, they kill the cell as they leave. And sometimes they leave the cell alive. So as this is happening, this, of course, eventually sparks our immune system because the body says, hold on, something, something is wrong because healthy cells are dying and they're not supposed to be dying. So our immune system is sparked. And so that is um, our innate and our adaptive immunity kick in then. But you get uh, interferons coming into play. Pro-inflammatory cells like our cytokines, which we talked about before, our chemokines and our antimicrobial peptides come in to kind of slow this process down because now the body has the responsibility of getting rid of virus, but not harming itself. So that's the balance that our body has to deal with um, because these viruses are inside of normal healthy cells and making them sick. Um, so while all of this is going on, there is the there's a loss of cellular junction. So that's why you get all of these this leakage, vascular leakage, edema, mucus is being produced. As I said before, you're getting programmed cell death, but you're also getting unprogrammed cell death. Death cells that are not supposed to be dying are dying, and then you get sloughing of the epithelial cells. Um, and so all of this is happening. And so this is what's happening inside of us. On the outside, all we've know is that we're getting runny nose, congestion, cough, and sore throat. But the reason we get that is because our immune system is working. And I don't, I want people not to be afraid of this because this is what it's supposed to do. Now, I know that the symptoms are frustrating. I know it, it is annoying, but this is what the body is doing to protect itself so that this virus does not create permanent damage to the, to your body. And fever can also kick in at this stage also as well, right? Yeah, yeah. And the reason I'm kind of, you know, and that's with the cytokines and the chemokines. The reason I'm not really going into fever, fever, because I'm doing upper respiratory rhinovirus, which typically doesn't lead to fever. But of course, fever comes in with influenza, um, para-influenza, um, corona, those type of viruses. So what do we do? Um, typically, and typically people like to use uh, decongestants and antihistamines, which limit these symptoms. Did you want to take a commercial break, Dr. Montgomery? Uh, let's see how much more you have to go. Um, maybe like seven more slides. Oh, we can go through all the slides. We'll take a okay. break and we'll come back and cover questions. Okay. So um, typically, and I put CC up here for common cold just to keep us, keep our mind in that zone. Um, we treat the symptoms more so than treat the virus, but there's little evidence that these uh, treatments help to shorten the duration of our URIs. And actually in 2008, the FDA pulled some medicines from the counter because they're doing no benefit for, to children under four and they're also increasing the harm. And actually a study showed that after this was pulled, then ED visits from <clears throat> injuries caused by taking these over-the-counter decreased by a half. So that's major. 
And I see in my own practice right now with Tylenol and Motrin or acetaminophen and ibuprofen, um, it's, it's seemingly used like water. And I have the discussion all the time not to use these unless we need to. Um, and then need to is kind of a very subjective word too. Um, but you know, the thing is, if it's on the count over the counter, people think that it's a hundred percent safe and they just give it, give it, give it constantly. And, and that, that is scary in itself. Um, they've modified labels now also to read that if you're less than four, do not use it unless you've gotten, um, the instruction or from your PCP or from your doctor or from a medical professional, because they know that these medicines can't do have potential harm to children under a certain age because they haven't been tested in children under it, under a certain age. And then in 2011, the whole industry pulled um, some of our cough and cold medicines for some of the ingredients that they have. Now, these drug companies are very clever. They just changed their ingredients. They kept the um, their medicines out but a lot of them got pulled at that time. I guess if they tweak the ingredients, they can uh, renew their patents, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So looking at therapies considered not effective for the common cold in children, this is for children, and antibiotics we know do not have any effect on the common cold. Antibiotics do not help with the common cold. Antibiotics do not help with the common cold. If I can make that a song, I would. Um, let's hear it, darling. All right, let's give it a beat. All right, let's give it. Antibiotics don't help with the common cold. Antibiotics don't help with the common cold. Antibiotics don't help with the common cold. I hope they got that. Yes. Um, and that also includes if you have purulent rhinitis. So the thick green, yellow, purple, orange, red. Does, it doesn't matter. Um, so that is what I wanted to get out of this slide. Now, there's some other things on here that they say are not really helpful. Um, diphenhydramine, um, prednisone, prednisolone, antihistamines over the counter. They list all these things as not being affected. This is a, um, from a Cochrane study. And so these are randomized controlled trials. It shows you in the evidence how many trials or how many um, studies they have done. So it's not, you know, some of them have one randomized control trial um, over a five day course. So, but it gives us some kind of idea of when they look at um, certain modalities, what seems to help and what doesn't make any changes. And most of them didn't really make a change when you compare them to placebo. At the bottom down here, you see vitamin C, which we talk about a lot, but it wasn't studied in children. So they didn't give us a conclusion on that one. Things that they do consider effective for common cold in children um, is in acetylcysteine, uh, corticosteroids, and inhalers, and that's for the people who have asthma and allergies, those type of upper respiratory things. Um, honey, if you're over one year old, nasal washes, which we talked about, vapor rubs, and zinc. Now also you see they put on this chart, the duration and the dosing for these types of things. May be effective for chemo prophylaxis. So this is before you even get sick. Um, we have nasal washes here. We have probiotics, which is very interesting. Vitamin C, two weeks to nine months before you get sick. So this should be already in your system going. And zinc. Um, six days up to, to up to five months. And then from one to 10 is up to seven months. So this is having these items already going in the system. The mm -hmm. mm -hmm. kit is a combination that um, some doctors put together of echinacea, um, vitamin C, and like a B resin. That's what, that's what that is. I had to look that up. So, so, so basically, these things on the list would be things that, as you alluded to, you would have. I mean, may, so let's say the cold season, winter's coming, the cold season coming, maybe November, uh, perhaps even October. You started to take these things on an increased basis, on a regular basis throughout the winter. 
yes uh, to help prophylax is that is that the uh, be taking them all idea? the time anyway i mean it's kind of like prepping mm -hmm. for the you're prepping for the winter in the summer so if any of us are gardeners or farmers or you know that you prep for their winter crops during the summer so you now, prep, go ahead now the vitamin d i imagine you're going to get to that but that's one that's also important in terms yeah. of boosting the immune system we'll get yeah yeah okay yeah these are the things that they studied mm -hmm. the, the that was in the study gotcha that's, i'm just sticking with that gotcha what was in the study because you know i know you like evidence-based medicine well, I mean, we, <laughs> I mean, a lot of different sorts of evidence, but I agree. I mean, it's, you're right. Uh, a lot of good sources, but yeah. Yeah. But, you know, and then the, the um, statement I have down here at the bottom, if anything, if these modalities decrease the use of decongestants, antipyretics, mucolytics, and antibiotic use in children, and it decreases school absences. So by that by itself is a success story for me. That's I good. think that's a wonderful thing. Keep it from school. And, you know, that whole uh, evidence-based medicine phrase is all in my ears, so almost like a cuss phrase because, you know, a lot of my colleagues use that. And then the evidence they're using is only skewed evidence that's supported by big pharma. I'm not going to get into that, but <laughs> but it's, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now we're going to look into the adult world. Adults. Our song. <clears throat> Dr. Atkins. Oh. Antibiotics do not work for the common cold in adults either. Um, and then you have antihistamines used by themselves. So they're talking about antihistamines as a monotherapy. Um, codeine, which used to be pretty popular back in the day. Um, they actually name nasal irrigation and vitamin C, but this is being named because it's being used when you actually have the cold. They later on say it's better used as a prophylaxis. Mm. Things that may be helpful is decongestants with or without the antihistamine, so using them together. Um, Atrovent, which is um, anticholinergic, which helps <laughs> to dry up, and that's not something that we necessarily prescribe a lot of. Um, rhinorrhea, which it dries mucus is what it does. The, um, because it's anticholinergic. Um, we have guafenicin and dexamethorphan. Also, these are all kind of drying agents, but the evidence on that says that some of sometimes it's helpful and sometimes it's not. And then our NSAIDs, which we, the, the excuse me, the acetaminophen and the ibuprofen help with pain relief. It also, I saw that it decreases sneezing and I didn't even want to put up here that it has some benefit with cough, because I feel like we overuse it and that's not what it was intended to be used for, but I will accept that it helps the pain relief. Now, um, alternative medicine that may be helpful in adults is our echinacea. We have geranium extract, our zinc, and they actually said garlic needed, needing, needed to be taken 12 weeks prior, because that's prophylaxis. Um, and that is raw garlic, so raw crushed garlic, because once you cook it, then you change that allicin that is the healing property in it. It changes once, it's, once heat hits it. Do you know if the fermentation, low, low heat fermentation should preserve that, should it? I don't know if it preserves it. It, sound, it seems like it's quite, it. they specifically say crushed raw garlic. So I don't know if when you fermented that changes the chemical structure of that. I will have to look that up. Um, and vitamin C. So this is where vitamin C comes in. 40 days to 28 weeks, so around three months before getting that vitamin C in your body. Now, the, the, the thing is, if we're eating right, you have it in there already. I mean, that's the magic of it all, if we're eating like we should be eating, then it's already mm -hmm. going to be there. It's nothing to really worry about. But we know that that can be a challenge. So other things that we can do to kind of support our immune system is, of course, rest and hydration. But there are things that we should be not doing to not add to the insult that's happening to the body. So stop all forms of smoking. 
that includes hookah and everything else that's out there. Stop all forms of alcohol. What's hookah? All forms of caffeine, high fatty foods, dairy, <laughs> processed foods. All of these things are creating more of an issue for our, our immune system. So you're just making this illness last so much longer than it needs to. Of course, hand hygiene, sunlight, exercise, and guess what's next? What's nutrition. next? Nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> well, just shoot me right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you know we had we had to go there because that's what we talk about on the show. Um, yes. So vitamin. I mean, there are many vitamins, but. I'm gonna we're naming vitamin A, C, D, E, zinc, selenium, omega threes, and of course we know that in these foods there are more vitamins than what man has discovered. So that's the magic of taking this into your body is you're getting so much more than we even know exists. So it is hypothesized that these vitamins help the body to produce antibodies. It helps in the proliferation of the lymphocytes, white blood cells, and it helps reduce the stress, the oxidative stress on the body. They also are starting to realize that micronutrient deficiencies and general malnutrition, which many people are micronutrient deficient and malnourished, um, creates an immune system dysfunction altogether. So a lot of people, even though I think I know that when we think about malnourishment, we think of um, people being cachectic and wasted and small, but there are a lot of normal weight and overweight people who are malnourished. Um, also micronutrient deficient. So we have to know that that is happening because if you're not eating the nutrients and you're not taking them in in any form, then you are going to have deficiencies. And the scary part or the sad part about that is that there are viruses out here like Coxsackie and influenza um, that really like that situation because they get increasingly virulent and replicate even more when they have a nutritionally deficient host cell. Um, so that gives them a nice, beautiful home to, to, to settle down in. And I mean, to your point about the malnutrition, I mean, most people who are overweight or obese are malnourished. And, yeah. and to emphasize that point, I mean, they're over caloried, but yes. malnourished. Exactly. And so, um, you know, and I think that's an important, uh, um, uh, point that you made because you know nutrients are different than calories necessarily. I mean, so calories are part of the nutrients, but they're not always just going to get in a lot of calories. I mean, you're getting a lot of nutrients, right? <clears throat> and then I also, you know, since you said that, I'll reemphasize that in the pediatric world, a lot of people feel like a fat baby is a healthy baby or toddler is a healthy baby, and that is not true. Um, and I spend a lot of time trying to explain that to families. We, just because the baby is over, well, full and, and um, does not mean that we are at a good position. Um, and many times we have to do some work to get that weight off the baby before we get into, and I say baby, I'm talking about toddlers, um, until we get into danger zones. Okay, and so just I'm just going to pull out four of those zinc. There are food sources of zinc. Um, and what you see here are our, our lentils are here, um, chickpeas, sunflower seeds. I think those are Brazil nuts down there in the corner. Not my favorite, but they're here. Um, mm -hmm. And those are good sources of zinc for us and also supplementation. So we know um, <clears throat> nowadays supplementation is almost, I would say, necessary because sometimes our foods lack all of the nutrients that we need. So we use the supplements to kind of fill in where the foods may be, may have, may be lacking. Um, vitamin C, when we think of vitamin C, we oftentimes think of citrus, but vitamin C is also in our broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, uh, bell peppers. So it's in many different foods. And I just put a, a longer list up here for that, up that. So you don't think it's just oranges, 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 because it's not. And all um, the supplementations, with liposomal vitamin C and the Atkins often tell us about buffered vitamin C. We have omega threes, um, which I know a lot of people take fish oil, but there are plant-based sources for that. We have our chia seeds, our hemp seeds, um, blueberries, our walnuts, 
And the reason that I don't, I'm not an advocate of the fish is not just because I'm plant-based vegan, but that's part of the reason. That's one. But two, the oceans are so polluted. Um, so whether it's wild caught or fresh, um, the fish are in contact with the, the water, the oceans. And with the pollution level being so high, they are taking in those items and toxins into their cellular structure, which means when we eat that, we're taking that into our cells. So the benefit of the omega-3 that the fish has is probably negated by the toxins and the other things that could potentially be in their cellular structure from being in that environment. Um, and then our vitamin D, we know vitamin D is a hormone actually produced by the sun, so getting outside. Unfortunately, um, most of us nowadays, there's it's almost impossible to probably get outside as much as we should with the full-time jobs. So we also do supplementation with D3 to help us get there. Okay, so I'm, I'm hoping that I shed some light on the upper respiratory tract and upper respiratory tract infections being viral, antibiotics do not work. Um, and also trying to come up with a medication because I think people want a medicine to fix everything, a medicine to fix a virus or the cold, let's stick with rhinovirus, is too, very difficult because it's so fluid and evolving and changing so rapidly. So, you know, this is why lifestyle modifications is where you're going to get the best bang for your buck. Um, and it's going to be preventive, but even if you do catch it, because sometimes you do, we are still human. We are still interacting on the planet. You may come in contact with something. You may catch something, but you should have fast recovery if your lifestyle is in such a way that it can fight off these viruses faster. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, that, that's an excellent presentation. Whoa, look at that garden. Wow. Impressive. <laughs> I see the stone there. Oh my goodness, you're a big time gardener. That's uh, that's, <laughs> that's a recent harvest. That is last year. Last, last year, month. yeah. Still very impressive. Wonderful. So uh, what we're going to do is take a quick break here, and we're going to come back and uh, address some questions and answers. I made some notes, and I think you guys may have seen some. Uh, we will go a little bit over, but I think it's going to be worth it. It's a very important topic. Uh, and a very great presentation. I want to uh, make sure we cover all of these questions. So I saw a lot of great questions. So hang tight. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Okay, wonderful. We are back. And I want all of you to give Dr. Palmer a digital hand of applause while we are still on the air, as opposed to when we go off. This is a great presentation. And I'm going to bring Dr. Palmer back up. Dr. Palmer, I'll move your slides to the side. If you want to, me to bring them back up, I can. And you can just, no. if you want to refer back to a slide okay. and answering some of these. Um, you, uh, I, I saw some out here and a couple of uh, points I want to, a uh, question I made. Uh, and uh, but uh, there's a question asked earlier about keeping uh, mucus moving and how does one do that? Uh, and then a follow up to that was a, a question about the lymphatic system. So how about this? You mentioned we should keep the lymph, uh, the mucus moving. What is there a process to that or what, what is your recommendation? So that <clears throat> a, a good way of doing that is the steam showers, um, humidified air. It helps to thin those secretions out. And once you thin those secretions out, they'll naturally drain. So I tell parents and adults can do the same thing, of course. It's just that I'm a pediatrician, so I reference my the kids a lot. But um, get into that shower. Don't get into the shower. Get into the bathroom. Get it steamy. Let that steam kind of break up that mucus and let it just drain, drain out. Um, with yeah. the kids also, we do uh, nasal saline. In adults, you can do the nasal saline washes and the, and the nose Frida where... For the children, the parent kind of sucks it out um, mm -hmm. with the nose frida. 
to move the mucus so it's not just sitting in the pharynx and then the sinuses and then the nasal cavity. In, your, in the adult population, we we was thought about guafenicin. I've used like a pure guafenicin. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, Warren, do you use that in the, the children's population? Are there some natural sources of guafenicin, or is it all just over the counter? We don't we don't use that as much in children. <clears throat> um, and I think on one of those slides, it talked about it said echinacea. Uh -huh. um, and geranium as a as a source. Um, uh -huh. but, I mean, in pediatrics, we don't prescribe. We should not be prescribing that many cough medicines. We try to kind of support them with information yeah. when it's a common cold. And I, you know, personally, I've noticed that, uh, and, and uh, Doctor Floyd, I'd like you to chime in on this natural guafenicin versus the over the counter stuff. And I've noticed that. Um, lemon, when I make a hot lemon juice or lime juice, it can serve as a mucolytic. I've had that experience personally. Is that your experience, either of your experience with using uh, citrus and water, hot water as a mucolytic? Or that, and, and that's one. And then the other part, are the other natural mucolytics, uh, either natural guafenicin or other natural mu mucolytics other than guafenicin that you know of for our audience? Um, I think yeah, I would agree with you on that. I mean, I think that's the kind of the bottom uh, foundation of of when we used to grow up and we used to make hot toddies where it was basically lemon water. Uh, they would always add something like honey to it. Uh, but I think the, the honey, the, the honey benefit is is basically an immune stimulant for for some people more so than having a, a benefit of the sugar. But uh, but yeah, it, you know, the the lemon has an astringent effect. Plus, I think just the um, the, the citric has that has that um, mucolytic effect. You know, I typed in the chat manuka honey. It's one that a lot of people recommend. Um, I'm not sure if that's one k or two k's, but either way, I use one k if you need to. But um, okay, now that's a good one. Also, ginger. You know, so honey, lemon, ginger, turmeric. Those things help. They're anti-inflammatory to the body, antiviral, um, antibacterial. So those things will also help to uh, thin the mucus, you know, and I think if we stop doing some of the things that we're doing, it'll thin naturally because our body is clearing this stuff out. And when I say stop, I mean, we stop the sugar, we stop the milk, milk is going to make us thick. Um, we stop the processed foods, we stop these things. I think that naturally it will thin itself, but if we keep doing even though we sometimes we just don't know, but if we keep doing those things, then it makes it harder. I don't know what's a metaphysics site. I just somebody's asked about your metaphysics site. You know, I don't have the metaphysics site. <laughs> can they explain? Can they explain <laughs> what that means? It seems like we all need to get one, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Maybe I need to get one. <laughs> but one other thing, I'm gonna get some other questions. One other thing I'll mention too along those lines is simple hydration. I agree with you 100 percent by stopping things and when somebody calls us have upper respiratory tract, I say go raw detox. I mean, you may not be raw your whole life or uh, plant-based, but if you have a uh, the, one of the therapies go like a raw detox regimen, raw fruits, vegetables, like you said, you're removing all those mucus forming uh, foods. And then uh, the other thing is that uh, you're hydrating the body. And of course, those nutrients that you're talked about uh, is uh, also coming in the system. So a raw detox, uh, as you imply, by removing bad stuff and, and consuming raw plant foods and hydration, drinking lots of water. Um, lymphatic system, is that, I mean, I think, I guess you can do massages and, and mobilize lymphatics and help drain. I know what massages help drain sinuses, and, and I know that's a, a mechanism. Anything else you can think of regarding lymphatic system? Um, you probably don't want to do this while you're sick, but do you remember those little um, <clears throat> nephilims that we used to have? Was that back the people used to have back in like the eighties, nineties? The little mm -hmm. trampolines that everybody used to have in their oh, house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> those, yeah. those help help the lymph system to dump and cleanse themselves. Oh, that's also, right. That's right. But rebounding, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, hey. um, when you're a child, we do these things more, but up upside down you know the, the adults do it in the, the tables the levitation tables but you don't have to get that fancy you could 
get upside down um, on your uh, do the yoga move upside down or you could probably lay on your bed and hang your head down upside down. Anything that kind of switches the level um, of the body will help to kind of dump the, the lymph nodes and clean out that system. Help let gravity help you out. The, yeah. um, now, the, there's a, you mentioned strep throat, and I wanted to make a comment and then, you know, raise a point. You know, strep throat, uh, well, there's several issues with strep throat. You know, we, we deal with strep throat in the cardiology standpoint in terms of the long-term sequelae. So people get strep throat, and they can have long-term sequelae. They get heart disease and valve disease in particular, uh, kidney disease, arthritis, and the, the point I want to make with that is that that's a well-known long-term sequelae of an infection. A lot of people talk about, you know, uh, COVID, uh, long COVID syndrome. But a lot of these infections, I've seen other upper respiratory tract infections have long syndrome. I had a patient come in uh, with severe neurological problems and wasn't able to walk at the minimum to the hospital. We gave him stories and everything. And his history was he had caught an upper respiratory tract infection uh, from somebody in a movie theater. And we had to detox and now steroids help, but we are really treating a long sequelae of an upper respiratory tract viral syndrome. And any of these viral syndromes can have a, a long uh, sequelae where it's neurological or you know, systemic inflammatory. And strep throat is well known, so I thought I'd throw that out since you went into strep throat. The other question I wanna ask you regarding strep throat and other infections, how do we know, so I come in with a cough of upper respiratory tract infection and I get my throat swab and it's positive for strep. How do I know that that strep positive test is due to a strep infection or strep colonization? And my infection may be due to something other than strep or any other vowel, whether it could be influenza or whatever. I mean, I'm not gonna mention COVID, but you know, kind of, how do I know whether something, a positive in a test mm -hmm. means it's infection I can have symptoms, but I may have symptoms due to something, something else. else. Yeah, I mean that happens a lot. We don't know, um, and it's when that when that patient keeps coming in with strep after we treat them, and they come back and they keep coming back, that we say this must be a colonization, because okay. you know you don't know just by the the test if you have two things going on at the same time. Because I mean, and, we, one, yeah. and one is a colonization in the background. Yes. Okay. I mean, and that was the question came up. We mentioned that person had repeated episodes and we're probably treating. Uh, and that's the thing we, and that's why I like these natural approaches. You have the immune system take care of things because if we will treat something specific, but we may be aiming a gun in the wrong direction and you've got something over here and we get a test that says, oh, this is positive, but it's not the true cause of the pathology or symptoms, but rather it's something positive on a test that's misleading us. And, and these natural things enhance your immune system, take care of whatever the problem is, which which I think is important. Um, there were other questions. Now, if y'all see questions there that I may have missed, uh, let me know. But there was a question about copper with zinc. Uh, how do we determine how much copper with zinc? That was about divine life at 742. Well, one thing about copper is that, you know, in your in your diet, if you're eating any mineral content food, you should get sufficient amount of copper. It's only a few, and you know, they have a lot of uh, external copper appliances, whether it's a copper clothing or copper material that, that has an, an enhancing effect. It's antiviral, actually, uh, that will help. But as far as internally, you know, the zinc is way to go. I don't think taking uh, internal copper because they do sell copper supplements, uh, but I don't think it's... Uh, affected that way. But the external copper can be ha uh, helpful as well. Yeah, uh, yes. Um, now, it has uh, uh, antiviral and antibacterial uh, uh, benefit. What's the mechanism of the anti, with the external, this side I get a copper bracelet, what's the mechanism of that? Now, th that's on the question. I've been, I've been uh, trying to get to the bottom of that. But uh, what I really think is, is that the, the positive ions that the copper is giving off tends to disrupt, uh, you know, the uh, cell structure of viruses or affect bacterial uh, replication growth. Gotcha. So it doesn't have to be internalized. That's, that's good. Mm -hmm. it, it, it can be limited by the body. Now, someone raised a question. I guess it could be controversial. I'm going to kind of address it. They asked about blood donation from vax to unvax. 
I'm not aware of any uh, data regarding uh, effects of blood donation of vax and unvax uh, people. Now, vaccines have been around for a long time and people get vaccinated for a lot of things, hep B, et cetera. I'm just not aware of any data. Uh, I don't know if we've actually looked at, you know, they this I've got the hepatitis B vaccine and I donate blood and what effects are going to have on somebody who hasn't gotten the hepatitis B vaccine? Are they protected? Are they, you know, I, I'm not aware of any data. Are y'all aware of any data on, on any data on vaccinated uh, uh, blood donation from vax to unvax and vice versa? Well, you know, actually, I heard an interview from, a, 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 I guess, an employee of, uh, at a blood bank, and they were talking about the people not donating, and they were they kept emphasizing to the public in their in their in interview that uh, that uh, the vaccines, vaccinated, unvaccinated, doesn't affect your blood supply or is not transmitted that way. Which I don't know. I, I didn't have a chance to look into more details or look for research data, but that was this that was the uh, position of the of the blood bank industry that, that it's no effect for the vaccinated or unvaccinated. Now, did they, did they support that statement with data or, you know, evidence? No. And, and that's why I say I wanted to follow research to just check it out for myself, but I haven't done that yet. But uh, um, I guess they, they were making that statement just based on the fact that I don't know if their supply was low or they had some specific data that said it's not uh, it's not uh, a problem. You know, that, that could be another whole can of worms, uh, a, a discussion for another day, because it, yeah, I've heard other uh, people come to the conclusion that, uh, you know, if 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 people are vaccinated or unvaccinated and it gets into the blood supply, it can affect everybody and, and uh, ends it out of that. But we'll save that. Yeah, we don't have information on that. A lot of people throw a lot of theories around. I like to just see, look at evidence uh, of things. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, Seymour, thanks, Dr. Palmer. How about humming for increase in production of nitric oxide in the sinuses that attack viruses? It also vibrates the sinus and keeps stuff moving. I understand the vibration part, the nitric oxide. I didn't know how. How does honey, humming increase nitric oxide? That's an interesting point, question, actually. I don't know about the nitric oxide part, but I would think humming, yes. Anything that vibrates and moves that. I mean, you know, in our cystic fibrosis patient, patients, I remember doing chest PT where we physically are patting them before they got the jackets. Um, we used to physically pat them. So any kind of manual movement um, is going to help to move that mucus. It seems like it's not doing a lot, but it but it does. And then, you know, humming or ohms. I don't know if that's what, the you know, she's getting into ohming and having your tongue kind of connect with the top of your hard palate um helps to vibrate that um and it does a lot of other things for the body too so that always can be a good thing fascinating and then this is uh can a person take too much zinc anybody and the answer is yes i don't i don't know um i know there is a uh upper dose of zinc because you can have a toxic from taking too much but i, I don't think the the over the counter medications. I know 50 is uh, kind of a higher dose that's supposed to be effective against uh, colds and flus. Um, but I have to see what the upper limit would be, you know. This water soluble is mostly gotten rid of by through the uh, uh, renal function, right? Through the kidney? Um, yeah, most minerals are, but. Um, I, I, but I, it seems in, in my study there were some toxic levels of zinc, but it's pretty high. But I don't know what it is. So, yeah. You know, There's a choice, I, I mean, I think it's one of those that if you try really hard on any of these things, you can do too much of it. But, but oh uh, if you stay very close to safe level, you should be in good shape. Um, somebody yeah. with renal failure, renal dysfunction may have to be yeah. more uh, alert to, to any mineral supplementation because it's, it's one of those things that, like you said, minerals are balanced by the kidney. So, Typically in the disease state is where you're going to really want to be alert uh, uh, to these things more so than if you don't have any end organ failure or severe end organ dysfunction, particularly in this case, the kidney. Um, but we, and, and we've talked about supplements before and we've did a series on it. We, we recommend that, you know, you um, get with a, 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 a medical person or a healthcare practitioner who's experienced in using um, um, supplements and nutraceuticals, 
um, and someone who can also follow you clinically and make adjustments. Uh, because as, as we always point out, and we point out this show, Dr. Palmer pointed out so well, your, your food should be the first source of, of all your nutrients, your ideal natural plant-based diet. And then micronutrients should be targeted based on, say, disease states or seasonal uh, disease risk or uh, in certain situations, you know, your particular uh, nutritional deficiencies, needs of the like. And so I think it's important to keep these things in mind. And even though we're mentioning these supplements, um, uh, I don't, and I think I speak for my colleagues that we don't advocate just going to any store and pulling things off the shelf and taking them. Uh, you know, supplementation uh, can potentially have benefit, but that can also be a potential harm of taking supplements, especially the supplements have lots of preservatives and other chemicals that can be toxic to your system. So it, it's not a, uh, an, uh, uh, a, an easy thing to just sort of pull something off the shelf and take it. Um, I had one patient had a, a you know, severe cardiac arrhythmia when he uh, shortly after he had taken some herb or supplement off the counter you know, had through a big uh, embolus to an artery in the leg and the like. And so we're not sure if it's that supplement or not. We're not certain, but there's a very strong temporal relationship with the consumption of that and the onset of his condition. Now, uh, you know, he, he's doing a great job at, you know, taking care of his diet and everything, but just one supplement of the wrong type can, can make a big difference. And so you want to make sure you're following up with a healthcare provider who you know, again, you can have an adverse reaction to any of the supplements, quality or none, but someone who can follow you carefully and uh, make sure, A, you're getting the positive benefits from or the hoped for or anticipated benefits from the supplements, and B, you're not, you know, suffering any adverse uh, effects uh, from that supplement of micronutrients. So I just want to emphasize that. Any other, uh, Dr. Atkins, yes. Yeah, I, I got the answer for zinc real quick. I have I looked it up. But yeah, 30, 30 to 50 milligrams of zinc is, is probably the recommended dosage for its use is for its fighting uh, flus and viruses. Uh, one thing it, it noted that, you know, when people eat oysters, eating three ounces of oysters give you about 85 milligrams of zinc. And some people go in oysters and they do oyster binge. So you can't get a lot of it without having a problem. If you if you have three ounces of oysters and somebody beat a half a pound of oysters, they're getting a, they're getting almost, you know, three or four hundred milligrams of zinc because that's the highest, that's the food with the highest level of zinc in it. So it doesn't seem to really kill you, but uh, they, the recommended dose is, is uh, 40 to 50 milligrams as an average dose. And I think that's, that's, that's good for, you know, cold and flu season. Yeah. Oysters have other ways, of, oyster consumption have other ways of killing you other than the zinc, I bet. Oh, but, uh... oh I, <laughs> we don't talk about parasites and <laughs> bacteria and, you know, and the rest of the stuff in the ocean, the PCBs. And, yeah. You go I've been putting my kids through college on oyster consumption. Uh, Jennifer <laughs> Fisher asked about, uh, does anyone have an opinion on apple cider vinegar as a treatment? Apple cider vinegar is mineral rich, isn't it? Uh, yes. Well, the, the alkalizing effect of apple cider vinegar is what's the positive thing uh, in the stimulation of the immune system. Um, but yeah, that that's uh, it. it it, it's something that you can do, you know, lemon juice, al uh, alkalinity, the apple cider vinegar. Uh, you know, what we recommend is doing at least two tablespoons and eight ounces of water. Be sure to do an adequate amount of water because if you just do it straight every day. It can have a um, um, effect on your teeth. But but yeah, just diluting the water two ounces. But it, it's, it's the alkalizing benefit that it helps enhance immunity. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, as usual, I learned a lot tonight, and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Palmer. We're going to give you the last word uh, of this session uh, to uh, help us close out. What are your final comments to our audience and to anybody who may be listening now or later? Well, thank you all for listening, but um, I just want to kind of give us a background and a foundation to step out into the world with and feel confident that, okay, if I catch anything, um, that I know what to do with my body and how to help my body to recover quickly um, and not um, go down into a spiral of, well, what's about to happen next? That's why I feel like people feel lost about what's about to happen next. And if we regain and we live our life with intention and we're doing things intentionally. I'm eating this because 
I'm going to empower my day or I'm doing this. I'm exercising because I'm going to empower my life and thinking in that sense instead of reacting, being a reactionary airy type person. So I just want us to ourselves do that for ourselves, but again, do that for our children because they're being born into a whole new society. So we have to equip them differently than we were equipped. And it's time for us to start taking the action and, and, and show them the way. Wonderful, wonderful. Well stated, well stated. Uh, I will see you guys backstage and I'll close out. Thank you very much again, Dr. Ax and Dr. Palmer. And uh, thank you guys from, uh, for supporting the channel and listening. Uh, and if you haven't already, hit the thumbs up, uh, give us a like. And uh, of course, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. Especially if you like this content, we give you this type of content on a regular basis. You have access to other uh, content we produced in the past and also future content. And of course, share this information uh, with friends, uh, loved ones, colleagues, uh, and um, uh, anyone you think would benefit from this. You know, illness has become the norm in our society. And that's something that you know, is a real problem. As, as Dr. Palmer pointed out, you know, just coals uh, has a major economic impact uh, on our economy. And it's something that is very simply treated, uh, number one, but more importantly, is simply prevented, as Dr. Palmer uh, mentioned in her closing comments, that by simply uh, doing the right things to take care of your health, with exercise, proper nutrition, even before the onset of a common cold, upper respiratory tract infection of any other type, uh, you can actually ward it off. Uh, or you can uh, enhance your innate immune system to the point that you don't get severe buildup of mucus and severe symptoms, but rather just very mild symptoms to the point that you barely notice that you've been invaded because your immune system takes care of it right away and gets rid of it. So really optimal health and, and overall well-being should be a proactive thing, not a reactionary thing, as she pointed out. And so I hope all of you uh, take that to heart. Again, give us a thumbs up, like it if you like it. Please subscribe if you haven't done so. And of course, share this with anybody uh, that you know, especially if they can benefit from this information. Until next time, keep it fresh, natural, and live. Mm -hmm.